Greetings. Today is Palm Sunday, the sixth Sunday of Lent, March 24th of 2024. This service was pre-recorded on Friday the 22nd. The participants include reader, video photographer, Shane Donnelly, and myself. If you go to our website, there is a list of all of our services and activities for the Holy Week. If in the area, why not join us? The outdoor and interior decorations will remain through mid-April. Have a good Lent. Boys and girls, in the past, I have shared with you how Christmas was celebrated in my home when I was a boy. And what I'm going to share with you now is how the Gilbert family celebrated Easter. Now, Christmas was a bigger event in my family than Easter, and Easter was more of a long weekend. And of course, I would be out of school from Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and Monday, and return on Tuesday. Now, on Wednesday, when I would go home, there'd be a big surprise in the kitchen. Do you know what this is? Have you ever seen one of these before? And and what about this? These are feeders and a watering can for peeps, for baby chicks. And when I would come home, there would be live chicks in a wooden box that my father bought for my brothers and myself. And back in those days, for Easter time, baby chicks would be dyed. Now, it didn't hurt them, and and as they grew, the color would disappear. Now, what we had in the United States before the dollar store we had chains of stores that were called a five and 10, meaning everything in the store was five or 10 cents. And that's where people would go the week of Easter and they would buy their baby chicks. And as I've told you on other occasions, the only pets I ever had in my life were chickens. Now, on Friday, my grandmother would make Hot cross buns. Now, my grandmother was from England, and hot cross buns are a big deal in the UK and the British Commonwealth. And I can I can almost smell them baking in the oven. And after my grandmother died, we continued to have hot cross buns. We would buy them at the store. But another thing happened in our home. Now, my mother ate bacon and eggs for breakfast every day of the year except Good Friday. She believed it was wrong for anyone to eat meat on Good Friday, that one way that we honor Jesus on the day that he died is that we don't eat, we we fast. And what my mother did, this is true, my mother would make signs and she would put it on the refrigerator. She put it on the freezer. She put it on the kitchen cabinets as a reminder to everyone in the house You better not eat meat. And we didn't. Now, another thing. On Saturday night, 
before my brothers and I would go to bed, my mother will have boiled dozens of eggs and we would dye Easter eggs. And my father would lay newspapers on the kitchen table and we would take empty soup cans and we used it for each color of the dye and we would all dye eggs. Now my father, who had been raised on a farm and they didn't have a lot of money, what he would do, he would take onion skins and he would show us when he was a boy how they made dyes. And if you would use a white onion, you get yellow dye. And if you have a yellow onion, you get an orange brown dye. And if you use a red onion, you would get a pink dye. And he would show us how that was, that was done. Now, and before I would go to bed, I would put my Easter basket on the dining room table, as did my brother's. This is my actual Easter basket, and it's about 66 years old, uh, when I was maybe around eight years of age. So the basket would be empty, and when I would get up Easter morning, it would be filled with all kinds of candy. Now, I never went to an Easter egg hunt. I never sat on the lap of the Easter bunny, but I always had an Easter basket filled with candy. And I can promise you, that there was a candy that all the Gilberts had, and it was maple egg. So this is a large maple egg, and these are small maple eggs, and maple flavoring, like you put on a pancake or a waffle. Now again, my dad was raised on a farm, and where the Rogers Flea Market is in nearby Ohio, that land was originally my father's parents' farm. And my dad said that as a boy, that he would go out and collect the syrup from the trees. All right, so maple syrup was like something really big in my family. And to this day, it would be my preferred, my, my preferred treat. Now, we had all this Easter activity in our home. And it seems like we're looking at baskets and candy and, and all kinds of fun things to do. But I understood the real meaning of Easter and that Jesus died on the cross and that he was buried in a cave. On the third day, he came alive. He's a, alive forevermore in heaven and that he hears our prayer. When I was in the third grade, the class had an Easter egg decorating contest. And we all had to make an Easter egg with our name on the back and put it on the wall. And before we went on our Easter break, my teacher, Mrs. Melnick, had all the other teachers come in and vote on first, second, and third prize. I won the first prize. Not because my egg was so beautiful. We all remember I was the only person in the class who put something that was Christian on the egg, a cross. And I understood that Jesus died and that he was our Savior. And that is why we celebrate Easter. And I'm certain that's one thing that I stress here at the church and something that I knew that you understand and that you will always believe that Jesus is our Lord and that we will love and serve him. You have a happy Easter. Christ is risen. Two lessons this weekend, both regarding the agony in the garden. I'm reading from the New International Version Bible. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, chapter 26, verses 36 through 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little bit further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. 
yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them, and went away once more, and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples, and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 22, reading verses 39 through 46. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Joining Las Vegas, Disney World, London, Paris, and Rome, Jerusalem has emerged to become a major tourist spot on the planet. Annually, upwards of 5 million foreigners, 20% of whom are American, walk the streets where Jesus walked. The entire old section of the ancient city has been designated a World Heritage Site. Historians dispute the authenticity of some of the locations associated with the events in the life of our Lord. One location which usually has credibility with most of the think tank is the Garden of Gethsemane. 2,400 years ago, the year 320, after centuries of state persecution, the Roman Emperor Constantine conferred a favor status to the Christian religion. Commissioning his mother, Helena Constantine, using imperial funding, sent her to the Holy Land to construct a network of shrines connected to the key episodes in the life of Christ. Saint Helena is the world's first archaeologist. Relying upon past traditions and making use of the best information available to her, Helena is responsible for the selection of the Church of the Nativity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Garden of Gethsemane. Helena's policy was that no edifice be built at the Olive Grove of Gethsemane. This natural setting to be left untouched preserved as an outdoor chapel, permitting Christians to pray where Jesus prayed and unload their burdens and experience the nearness of his presence. Her decision was a wise one. The Franciscan order of Catholic monks maintained Gethsemane. In recent years, as an act of goodwill, allowance has been made for Protestant groups to assemble on the grounds for worship. All four Gospels mention Gethsemane. On the timeline of the Passion, Christ was here one to three hours from 11 p.m. Thursday to 2 p.m. Friday after the Last Supper and before the arrest and betrayal by Judas Iscariot. Mary, the mother of Mark, one of the seven Marys in the New Testament, 
was well-to-do, owning both the upper room and this garden with an olive press outside the city walls. We are informed that when he was in town, Jesus came here for private prayer. Gethsemane is instructive, providing much illumination as we continue our Lenten journey. This nocturnal prayer vigil was not a last resort effort of the Master to equip him for what was coming down. Every major happening in his three-year ministry was occasioned by the time spent with the Heavenly Father. Christ prayed at his baptism during the 40-day fast in the desert previous to the selection of the twelve apostles before walking on the water, prior to Peter's confession at Caesarea Philippi, when teaching us the Lord's Prayer, the Transfiguration, and raising Lazarus from the dead. Three of the seven last words uttered by the suffering Savior from the cross are understood to be petitions of prayer. True prayer is communion with God, verbalized or silently expressed in our heads and hearts and spirits in any way, in any place, at any time. Prayer is not difficult or burdensome. Nothing is too trivial or minute to be laid before our Maker. The abbreviation ASAP has become very popular with texting, Spoken or written, it means as soon as possible. I've discovered online this spin, ASAP, always stop and pray. While in the home of a parishioner, I recall a framed print she displayed on the wall. It had as a caption, Why worry when you can pray? The only time the Gospels record that Jesus knelt in prayer is this mentioned by Luke. Matthew tells us that the Lord laid flat on the dewy grass, much like a man prepared to do a push-up in a gym class. In biblical times, Jews stood with uplifted hands in prayer. Frequency in Protestant churches, hands are folded and heads are bowed, with a seated congregation. Numerous postures and hand formations exist when talking to God. Variety is the spice of life. And perhaps consider periodically changing your bodily positions when approaching the throne of grace in petition. Some critics accuse the grand teacher of contradicting his own instruction. He counseled us not to engage in repetition in prayer. And what do we find at Gethsemane? Not once, but three times. Our Lord groaned in his spirit, If it be possible, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The Apostle Paul shared in 2 Corinthians 12.8, that he pleaded with the Lord on three occasions for the removal of the thorn in his flesh. Repetition is not condemned by the teacher of teachers. Vain repetition is denounced. Pious jargon and lofty theological phrases thrown around, which one really does not believe, and words conveyed without thought and conviction, and mechanical language sounding as if it came from a robot, or saying the same thing over and over like a broken record, come under the category of vain repetition. Earlier this week, I attended a Catholic funeral. A nun offered a prayer of intercession, requesting that we in attendance answer with, Lord, hear our prayer. The sentences the sister prayed were sincere, heartfelt requests capturing the mood and the mindset of the room of mourners. I think seven times we replied, Lord, hear our prayer. I do not interpret this liturgical action as vain repetition. 
but a stirring, meaningful prayer surely welcome by our Father in heaven. Three times the Lord went to his apostles and found them out like a log. Were they exhausted from the demands of the day with the preparation and observance of the Passover Seder dinner? Had they overindulged at the feast? Did the devil impose a, sp a drowsiness over them so they could be of no help to the Lord? One understanding of the proximity of Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, the executive committee of the apostles, they were Christ's prayer partners. Another viewpoint is that the leadership team needed to stay awake and pray, not for his benefit, but for theirs. Except for John the Beloved, after his arrest, the apostles would not lay their eyes on Jesus again until the resurrection. This was his final lecture before departure. The day would come when Christians would be fed to the lions. The master modeled for his disciples how one is equipped to remain faithful to the very end. Jesus displayed to them and to us, it's okay to suffer psychological anguish before physical torment. It's okay to get oneself to an emotional state where we sweat blood. It's okay to desire to evade the inevitable. And it's okay to engage in a tug of war with God and let him know that we are not altogether pleased with his plans for our lives. But there must be a resolution of surrender to his will. Our personal Gethsemane may be a hospital surgical suite, a boss's office, a courtroom, a funeral home, a family conflict, a war bunker, or finding ourselves behind prison bars. We know there is something we must do, the unavoidable, and we have called out the heaven and we confront the silence of God. Twice, God the Father spoke from a cloud to Jesus, a dove descended from the sky, a crack of thunder was overheard in the temple courtyard. God had spoken to his son by not speaking. He understood his assignment, and he had to obey. Bobby Richardson was a famous Yankees baseball player in the late 50s and early 60s. The noted evangelist is best remembered for officiating at the funeral of the legendary Mickey Mantle. Bobby Richardson had a narrow prayer, meaning it had one point. Dear God, your will be done. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. God answers our prayers. Yes, no, or wait. No is an answer. The 20th century British apologist C.S. Lewis said there are two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, okay, have it your way. When we sing, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, keep in mind, Jesus had a Judas who betrayed him, a Peter who let him down big time, and a Gethsemane experience. When God called him to a task, he was reluctant to fulfill. The silence of God was an answer of no. The cup of death was not to be taken away. Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, the orator of orators, said it best. You cannot always depend on prayer being answered the way we want them answered. But we can always depend on God. God, the, the loving Father, often denies us those things which, in the end, prove harmful to us. When we go to heaven, we will thank God not only for the blessings he gave us, but also for that which he refused. Don't be put out with God, imagining that he ignored you. 
God is God. He is not applying for the job. He knows what he is doing. He is the king of the universe. And it is his prerogative not to answer our questions. Did Queen Elizabeth ever appear on a TV talk show for an interview by a host? Your Majesty, how do you get along with your daughters-in-law? It is rumored your husband, Prince Philip, and you sleep in separate rooms. Is that true? What prime minister did you not like? Thatcher, Blair, or Kerry? The queen was never a guest on a show, nor did she have a news conference. Why? She adhered to royal protocol, that as the sovereign, she doesn't have to explain herself to anyone. God is the creator. We are the creatures. Let God be God and have the decree with the ultimate outcome for all things in our lives. Prayer is not simply getting what we want from God, but getting God. Staying up all night, wringing our hands, and pacing the floor, we do not acquire the miracle we asked for, sought, and knocked on heaven's door to receive, and we become disappointed with God. Or we can resign ourselves into his keeping to equip us for the challenge lying ahead. Jesus is the unique Son of God, one person with two complete and perfect natures, human and divine. The internal struggle at Gethsemane is that the human and the divine natures were in tension, not on the same page. What 33-year-old male wants to die? The theme song of the rock opera Jesus Christ Superstar refers to the crucifixion as a record breaker. A shameful, painful, and torturous death awaited Christ. But the agony of the Lord is not restricted to physical and emotional suffering. His is a travail of the soul. His mission is to be the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And as the scapegoat, he who knew no sin became sin for us. Human and divine natures came to an agreement. Christ was committed to the commission to be the Savior of the world. Gethsemane was the turning point. The struggle had been won. There was no plan B in the drama of redemption. The Son did not get out of going to the cross, but he got through it. When the temple police showed up to put the Son of God in handcuffs, there was no resistance from him. Composed and in control of the tense situation, Christ had died in Gethsemane before he mounted the cross. World boxing champion Muhammad Ali was aboard an airplane and refused to put on a seatbelt. The flight attendant came over to him and told the professional fighter that he had to conform the policy. Giving her a hard way to go, Muhammad Ali replied, I'm Superman, and Superman doesn't need a seatbelt. The stewardess answered, if you are Superman, you don't need an airplane. He did as instructed. Some Christians are bothered that a supernatural Jesus Christ was comforted by an angel. As the king of the angels, what can a celestial being possibly do for him which would be of any benefit? Was the Lord of life and the king of glory so weak that he needed an angel to empower him? Angels made frequent appearances in the Christmas and Easter stories, but only three occasions during the in-between 33 years. After the baptism, following the 40-day temptation in the desert, and here, the agony in the garden. 
three interpretations surround the angelic visitation. Number one, Satan tempted our blessed Lord at the beginning of his ministry during the 40-day fast, seeking to detour him from his mission. Lucifer reappears in a last-ditch effort to persuade Christ to call off the atonement with himself as the sacrifice. The The name of this angel is not disclosed. Some commentators speculate it is Michael the archangel. In the book of Revelation, the prince of darkness and Saint Michael go at it with the archangel victorious over old Nick, tossing him into the abyss for a thousand years. The presence of Michael in the garden serves a notice to the devil that he may want to rethink his diabolical schemes, messing around with the Son of God, because there is a coming day when the score will be settled. Number two, the angel is dispatched from the headquarters of heaven to let the Son of God know that all of creation is watching the unfolding drama of the salvation on earth. In his best-selling book, Angels, God's Secret Agents, by Billy Graham, the Prince of Preachers wrote, the angels would have come to the cross to rescue the King of Kings. But because of his love for the human race, and because he knew it was only through his death that they could be saved, he refused to call their help. The angels were under orders not to intervene at this terrible holy moment. The communique from the great white throne was delivered to the captain of our salvation. Do not summon the angels from above. And the third view of the angel is that Jesus Christ, like all of the people of God, had a guardian angel assigned to him at conception, his bris, ritual circumcision, or at some moment early in his life. Almighty God had designated that each of us be granted an angel, not only to protect us from harm and incline us to do good, but to act as an encouragement in trials and tribulations. The 23rd Psalm affirms that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. On one level, goodness and mercy are sheepdogs watching over the flock, and they symbolize guardian angels with us to the very end of the sojourn. Numerous dying Christians claim to see their guardian angel on their deathbed, coming to escort them to the other side. Within 12 hours, Jesus of Nazareth would be impaled on the hardwood of a cross. His angel arrives to equip him for his appointment with the angel of death. When it comes for us to breathe our last breath, there is an angel in the room with us and assured to transport us to the throne room of the king of the universe. Formerly, when I concluded a eulogy, I would say that the deceased took a TWA flight travel with angels. More recently, I add that the departed made a triple A journey, angels always attending. The angel at Gethsemane served as a reminder to Christ, his apostles, and to us that when the day and the hour that we are called to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there is no reason to be afraid for God is with us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.